Hi, this is Dr. Amr Ratib, Professor Emeritus of Univ uh, Dermatology in Cairo University. Uh, in the coming almost one hour, we are going to read together about atopic eczema, and the reference will be uh, Rook Textbook of Dermatology, last edition released at 2016. Let's first share the screen and see if we can work together in this. By all means, uh, uh, there is no intention for copyright infringement. Actually, this is a very respectable book. It's very extensive data inside it, and we need to summarize and learn how to read through it. We'll start with the definition and nomenclature. The definition of atopy has always been and still is a problem. Atopy means no place. So trying to define this no place disease to put it, to put its nosological position has always been difficult. Let's go to the definition and see. Atopy by itself is a personal or familial tendency to produce immunoglobulin E antibodies in response to low doses of allergens and to develop typical symptoms of asthma, rhinoconjunctivitis, or eczema. Okay, this is a description of the clinical course. It's not a definition. It's not clear terms to put it in any class of disorders. Again, Atopic eczema is an itchy, chronic, or chronically relapsing inflammatory skin condition that often starts in early childhood. The rash is characteristically itchy, papular, papulovesicular, preferably flexural, and becomes excoriated or lignified. Again, this is a clinical picture and course. Moreover, the nomenclature uh, is very uh, extensive. It's very different, different names for the same disorder. Atopic eczema, atopic dermatitis, eczema infantum, veneers, prurigo, prurigo, vebra, etc. So in a trial to unify at least the nomenclature, it's atopic eczema by the ICD-11. What is ICD-11? It's the International Classification of Diseases, number 11. It's released by the World Health Organization in June 2018, presented in the World Health Assembly in May 2019, will be effective in January 1st, 2022. The idea is that we agree on a single nomenclature term for a disease that still the pathogenesis is so controversial, so difficult. The ICD 11 is a trial to unify the term between the different doctors all over the world. So the definition describes the clinical picture and the progress. So what are the diagnostic criteria? The first trial was put by Hampin and Rajka in 1980, and it is more simplified and modified by Williams et al. in 1994. Look at the slide in front of you. It's an itchy skin condition. It's an itch that rashes. Itching is the most crucial, crucial factor in the diagnosis of atopic eczema. Plus three of the other five items. Two of them are clinically evident, onset below the age of two years, and visible dermatitis, be it flexural usually, but may affect cheeks, forehead, outer limbs, in children. And the other three items are history. History of the eczematous involvement of the skin, history of dry skin, this is very important, and personal or family history of atopic eczema or other atopic disease. So again, itching, dryness, eczema plus the history. As we said, the incidence is usually before the age of two years and 
Classically, before the age of five years, children, infants, start to show the tendency to eczema with different uh, grades of severity, according to the circumstances surrounding them at early age. Severe atopic eczema affects only less than 5% of the atopic eczema patients. This is very important. This means that we do not need the biologics, the cytotoxic drugs, whatever, in just few, few number of patients. There is actually, there's no uh, sex difference between the two sexes, but atopy, atopic eczema is one of the most prevalent skin conditions worldwide. And it is the leading cause of disability adjusted life years because actually it affects infants and children in school years and it affects adults working in different uh, uh, directions of life. It's the leading cause of disability. This is why it's very important. The pathogen pathogenesis of atopic eczema is so extensive and not a single factor uh, can be mentioned as the most crucial factor. But basically we have three major headlines. One is genetic tendency, the other is immunological abnormalities, and the third is environmental factors that aggravate or propagate the condition. Let's try to go through them, simplify what's written in the textbook. More than 200 reports of positive associations between atopic eczema and candid genes were reported. Only 13 of them were noted. Actually, anyone trying to link atopic eczema to one of the accused genes found it positive. But to us dermatologists, clinicians, 13 are the uh, most important, the most positively documented. Of them, I'm going to concentrate on filigree mutation, interleukin-4, and interleukin-13. Filigree mutation is the most identified defect until now. Pellegrin is responsible for the formation of the natural moisturizing factor in the stratum corneum, which is the main factor maintaining moisture inside the cells, the cell goals of the stratum corneum. The reduction in this natural moisturizing factor due mutation in filigree gene will increase the transepidermal water loss. So it will result the dryness that is characteristic in atopic eczema patients. Moreover, there is an association between the natural moisturizing factor deficiency and the reduced release of extracellular lipids and the impaired ceramide content of the extracellular lipids. This doesn't say that filigree mutation is responsible for the extracellular lipid defect, but the association is strong. So, does all the patients carry filigree mutations? Does anyone carrying filigree mutation gene should have atopic eczema? No, actually not, because there are many other factors. Only 20% of atopic eczema patients carry this filigree gene mutation. Only 50% of the most severe cases of atopic eczema patients carry this filigree gene mutation. Filigree gene mutation is present in 30% of exclusive vulgaris patients with having atopic eczema. In patients having filigree gene mutation, only 42% will develop atopic eczema. Filigree deficiency can be suspected clinically by the hyperlinear palms, the keratosis pilaris, or the presence of ichthyosis, same patient or in the family members. And of course, this means that other gene mutations work synchronously with filigree gene mutation to produce the clinical picture and symptoms of atopic eczema. Environmental factors are very important. Number one, the climate. In the northern and southern parts of the uh, globe, where the weather is cold and dry, there's more 
incidence and more severe cases of atopic eczema. While when the outdoor temperature is high, especially and humid, there's less incidence and less severity of atopic eczema. The relation to pollution and smoking is still controversial, not definitely proved or denied. And living in cities aggravates the atopic eczema, the symptoms and the signs, and the incidence in the cities is more than in the villages in the rural areas. Breastfeeding seems to offer some protection against the development of atopic eczema. And this is why the WHO recommends at least six months of exclusive breastfeeding for the newly borns. The diet. This is controversial about the diet in pregnant and breastfeeding mothers. And they say fish is recommended because of the fish oils, but again, there is no uh, conclusive evidence here. Obesity and physical exercise by obesity and physical exercise by themselves, the, uh, there is no clear data, but obese diet, obese children diet is poor in antioxidants. So this may be one of the reasons why obese children may have worse atopic eczema. Now the hygiene. The basic hygiene, the data are controversial, keeping your child clean or leaving him dirty, mm -mm. data are controversial, but there's a strong positive correlation with strong detergents. So if you want to clean your child, please don't use strong detergents. This will dry the skin and aggravate the eczema. Use of antibiotics, whether by the pregnant mother or by the newly born infant or child. This is very important. There is 7% increase in atopic eczema risk with every broad spectrum antibiotic course. This is too much. So we have to be very cautious giving antibiotics to our children unless really needed. Why? Because this actually disrupts the microbiome and the uh, uh, atopic children, the children with tendency to atopic dermatitis have disrupted microbiome. So we spoil it more by our antibiotics. Now living in the farm seems to offer better conditions for the children against atopic eczema. There is negative correlation with unpasteurized fresh milk consumption in infants, drinking milk fresh from the cow. Early exposure to farm animals and to pets offer some protection, while the first exposure when it comes in later age may aggravate the condition. Mothers exposed to endotoxins or to helminthes during the third trimester may offer some protection to their offspring against the development of atopic eczema. So living in the farm seems to be better in all conditions. Now, the most controversial part of the pathogenesis is the immune dysregulation. If you remember, if you have seen the two lectures before about the receptors of skin inflammation and the mediators of skin inflammation, finding a simplified, concise, straightforward scenario for the inflammation is rather impossible. Everything works together synchronously they promote and contradict each other at the same time. So let's try to understand some of the happenings in the atopic eczema skin, especially in the context of immune dysregulation. Immunological dysfunction in atopics, thank God, is not systemic. It's largely confined to the skin. So there is no contraindication to vaccination. The inflammatory cellular infiltrate is basically T helper cells. And they home preferentially to the skin, cutaneous lymphocyte associated antigen positive. They love to go to the skin. And basically, of course, T helper too. 
This is classic. This has been documented for decades now. Change of the infiltrating cells from T helper 2 to T helper 1 is a sign of regression of inflammation or chronicity of inflammation. T helper 2 cells express interleukin 4, 5, and 13. And I remind you when we talk about the when we talked about the genetic predisposition, we said mutations in interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 genes are important. Why? Interleukin-4 and 13 down-regulate filaggrin expression in keratinocytes. So the mutation in filaggrin by itself, in filaggrin gene by itself, in 20% of the patients needs the share with interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 to show. So they work synchronously. Interleukin-4 down-regulates cutaneous defenses and increases the expression of bacterial adhesion molecules. This means what? There's more adhesion of Staphylococcus aureus to the atopic skin. And this is a very important and crucial factor in the development and in the progress of atopic eczema. The thymic stromal lymphopoietin derived from the keratinocytes and the interleukin-31 derived from the T helper 2 cells, the mast cells and the Langerhans cells, both trigger each neuron's directly mediating prorites. No mention of histamine here. In most of the cases of atopic eczema, the itching is mediated by the neuropeptides and by the thymic stromal lymphopoietin, not by histamine. Langerhans cells in atopic eczema, they have high affinity for immunoglobulin E, so it's not just the mast cells, Langerhans cells too, and even the keratinocytes, they have weak affinity for the immunoglobulin E. We'll go through this. When the eczema turns into chronic, the interleukin-5, interleukin-12, granulocyte macrophage colon stimulating factor interfering gamma, they all promote growth and survival, survival of eosinophils and macrophages, and promote T helper function with keratinocyte apoptosis and epidermal spongiosis. Meaning what? We just mentioned that interleukin-4 five and 13 are higher in lesions. Five here is important for chronicity. The severity of the disease lowers, but it comes more chronic. Change from T helper two to T helper one is mediated through these mediators mentioned in front of you. Interleukin 22 down regulates filaggrin expression. Again, this is another factor adding to the gene mutation of filaggrin. So the change in filaggrin is crucial to the development of dermatitis, but it's not governed only by one factor, which is the gene. Other factors may help interleukin-4 and 13, as we mentioned, and interleukin-22. T-Rex. Classically, T helper cells were classified into T helper inducer and T suppressor cytotoxic. That was more than 30 years ago. T suppressor cytotoxic, that was a broad name. Now we have the T regs regulating T cells. They counterbalance pro inflammatory environment. Both glucocorticoids and allergy specific immunotherapy, they help the function of T-Rex to suppress inflammation. Staph aureus superangens, on the other hand, suppresses the T-Rex and the induced T-helper to function and inflammation. In an attempt to control inflammation, T-Rex, corticotropin releasing hormone, and interleukin-2, which is anti-inflammatory, are present in atopic lesion. So when we find interleukin-4, or 13, they are pro-inflammatory. When we find interleukin-10, it's anti-inflammatory. It's always, it's always a duel inside the body to regain the balance between the pro and the anti-inflammatory. Important thing here is that T-regs are normal in the atopic eczema peripheral blood. We'll come soon into another item. 
Eosinophils are usually high specialists in severe cases, but T-regs are normal in the blood. The problem is in the skin. The immune problem is in the skin here, localized to the skin. Okay, both natural killer cells and gamma delta T cells preferably secrete again type 2 cytokines in atopic eczema. It's not only the T helper 2. Any cell that can secrete mediators in this area will preferably go to type 2 cytokines. Moreover, a new subset of lymphocytes, the innate lymphoid cell, the new site was shown to secrete again type 2 cytokine in atopic eczema and in human skin after allergen germs. Now, atopic eczema patients may have high peripheral blood IgE levels, that's the extrinsic type of atopic eczema, or may have normal IgE, but both has high levels of circulating eosinophils. It's more important to diagnose. Allergy-specific IgE antibodies bind to high affinity receptors. We just mentioned that on masters, basophils, eosinophils, and Langerhans cells, and to low affinity receptors on keratinocytes. Internalization of the antigen antibody complex is crucial, again, to T helper 2 sensitization and the inflammatory cytokine release and production. Pellegrin is not present in the gastrointestinal tract or in the respiratory mucosa. Yet there is high association of atopic asthma and food allergy with pellegrin mutation, which is again the mutation is present in the genes. The genes affect the skin not the GIT or the respiratory tract, but there is high association between the filigree mutation gene presence and the development of the rest of the atopic diatheses. Disturbed barrier function in early childhood may help in pulmonary synthesization to aeroallergen. This is very strange to me because actually we used to believe, which is actually the major factor that aeroallergens go through the respiratory tract. But now research shows that the disturbed skin barrier function may help in sensitization against aeropollutions through the skin. So the first exposure may be through the disturbed barrier of the skin, and the sensitization occurs later through the respiratory tract. And the atopic marsh that was very famous some 10 or 15 years ago, starting with the IgE uh, levels increase, and then the eczema, and then the rhinitis, and ending with the asthma, is present only in 7% of the patients. And I actually doubt if there's any value, whether diagnostic or prognostic, to know the atopic marsh. I don't know. I'm sharing with you. Food allergy. Before mentioning anything about food allergy, look at the card in the down right corner. My dear doctor, thanks for everything. Now I can eat chocolates, mango, strawberry, and everything I want without allergies. Now I enjoy my life as a normal child. I keep this card. I removed the name and the photo of the dear child she's a grown-up now that's i keep this card for more than 17 years now she came suffering with her parents being deprived actually from everything that she loves without no one single positive uh, 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 data showing that chocolate or mango or strawberries or whatever aggravate the condition Yes, egg, milk, wheat, soy, peanut, and fish accounts for 85% of food allergies in atopic eczema patients. But not all atopic eczema patients have food allergies. Only a minority of them, by the way. Speaking about natural foods, not speaking about the food additives, coloring, and preservative agents, this should be 
uh, uh, actually banned. But talking about natural foods, we have to be very cautious. There are many ways to diagnose the food allergy, including the PIC test, the serospecific IgE, atopy patch test, the epicutaneous intradermal patch test, but we do not need this in every child coming to us, and we do not need to deprive, deprive them from the foods that they love and that is important for their growth. Food challenge testing is the most accurate for diagnosis. If you suspect, then stop and see if the patient improves or not, and then reintroduce and see if he gets worse or not. And food deprivation is never curative. May help in selected cases, but it's never curative, and actually it poses much stress upon the child and the parents. When food allergy results in urticaria, this worsens the dermatitis. Now, we mentioned that there is facilitation of the adhesion of the staph aureus to the skin of the adults. And we mentioned that there is decrease in the formation of the catholicidin and beta defensins, which are natural protective factors against the invading microbes. There is a defect in neutrophil chemoattractant interleukin 8. So this means neutrophils does not come so rapidly, so effectively to infected areas or colonized areas as they should. And there is a defect in inducible nitric oxide synthase, which kills the invading organisms. There is effective eccrine secretion of dermicidine-derived antimicrobial peptides. And there is a defective IgA production in sweat and tears and over the mucous membranes. So they have a higher tendency to get staph colonization and to get infected, mind you. Again, we worsen the condition by using systemic antibiotics unguarded. It's not the treatment in every case that you give antibiotics because you disrupt the microbiome. And after the effect of the antibiotic goes, new uh, colonization of the staph or and other microbes, and they are more resistant to antibiotics, will happen on the affected area. Staphylococcus aureus colonization in more than 90% of atopic eczema patients. Actually, we made very, uh, all the researchers made very much research on the colonization of sap aureus on the atopic eczema, clinically normal dry skin and the lesions, whether oozing or dry, staph colonization was always there. Staph here, releases super engines that correlate with the atopic eczema severity. The staph aureus super antigens enhance keratinocytes antigen presentation, upregulate human leukocytic engine class two and uh, interstellar adhesion molecules one expression and reduce the TREGS activity that stop or control the inflammation. Staph aureus super engines are called super engines because they have a superpower to induce a non specific inflammatory immunological reaction by themselves. Again, the infection. We all know that herpes simplex virus infection, infection in atopics, especially with severe eczema, may proceed to severe eczema herpeticum. Human papillomavirus and molluscum contagiosum, on the other hand, may tend to be worse. And the malassezia species in the colonization in the uh, specific areas in the skin, like uh, the scar, the anterior chest, the hairline uh, behind the ears, may help to worsen atopic eczema in superiac areas. Now, this is a very important factor. In a good percentage of atopic eczema, severe cases, there is autoimmunity. Atopic eczema, atopy by itself, is not an autoimmune disorder. But with scratching, there is release of membranous and intercellular antigens and the production of T helper 2 and immunoglobulin E against self proteins. 
This aggravates, this worsens the condition, and it is evident in more than 25% of chronic atopic eczema cases. Here's another controversy. In the areas where there's a tendency to vasoconstriction responses, the triple response, the white dermographism, whatever, we find elevated prostaglandin E2. Prostaglandin E2 is vasodilator, but sometimes vasoconstrictor in some tissues and in other circumstances, in some circumstances. There's increased phosphodiesterase E, it's pro-inflammatory, and interleukin-1, which is anti-inflammatory. There's a controversy again. These are just findings. They are not important actually for us as clinicians here. Pruritus. We agree that atopic eczema starts with itching, continues with itching, it manifests with itching. It's defined by an itchy rash. Itching is very important to the extent that sometimes when you find an infant with, or child, young child with atopic eczema, scratching his or her skin during sleep, and you take their hand gently and place it on your hand, you will scratch your skin. The orders comes from the brain. It's not always a reaction to a problem in the skin. This is very unique to atopic children. But again, it is closely linked to inflammation. Yes, it increases the inflammation. Most important here that non-histamine signaling is more relevant than histamine. So if you don't find clear signs of histamine release, so non-sedating antihistamines here are of no value. Actually, they work as placebo. Calcitonin gene-related peptide, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, and as mentioned before, interleukin-31 and TSLP. They all are effective, each mediator here, Interleukin-31 is the most potent each inducer in inflammatory atopic eczema. So the atopic skin is defective in the natural moisturizing factor. So there is no moisture inside the cell goals of the stratum corneum. Defective in extracellular lipid release and defective in ceramide and defective in sweating too. Sweating is less in patients in response to whether heat or challenge tests. Sweating here induces itching. Through major factor here is acetylcholine and neuropeptides on densely innervated perigranular areas. Atopic eczema may worsen with stress, they say nature is not fully understood, but they also tell us that there is reduced cortisol response to stress. So there are more tendency, there's more tendency to inflammation. And there is increase in neuropeptides, which are here pro-inflammatory and they stimulate itching. So this is part of it. Atopic eczema patients show lower than normal increase in stress-induced cortisol production have reduced sensitivity to anti-inflammatory effects of endogenous cortisone. This means that the same amount of cortisol in atopic patient reduces less effect than in a non-atopic patient. Receptors are less sensitive. Premenstrual flare is common, mostly psychogenic, mostly with salt and water retention and release of body temperature. And we all know that uh, really, uh, 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 elevating the skin temperature by half a degree increases the tendency to itching, lower the threshold for paritis. Atopic eczema may improve or worsen with pregnancy. I believe it depends on the psychological factors here and maybe some hormonal factors. So to summarize the long story, their genetic predisposition, especially with filigree mutation and disruptive barrier function. There is immune dysregulation confined to the skin, not uh, systemic, 
And T helper 2 and type 2 cytokine profile production are the major factors here. The immunoglobulin E may or may not increase, but eosinophilia is common in the blood, especially with severe cases. Staph aureus colonization with superantian release is the rule, is the uh, uh, standard here in atopic skin. Herpes simplex virus may cause eczema herpes. This is classic and we all know it. Proritis, I remind you again, stress that proritis is basically neuromediated rather than histamine mediated. There is an abnormal vascular response which is not, not really clearly, clearly understood. And there is reduced sweat excretion that aids in the dryness condition of the skin. Now, the second half of the lectures should be much easier than the first half. I'm sorry if I bothered you. Wait, take a sip of coffee. OK. Let's see clinical picture. We know presentation below the age of two years is the standard, sometimes before the age of two months. Itching is a presenting symptom, causing sleep disturbance and irritability. We mentioned the effect of the quality of life. Rash is usually chronic and fluctuating, if not treated, if not taken care of. And the condition are worsened by emotional stress, warmth, sweating, bathing, and wooden clothes. Let's stop here for a while. We said that atopic eczema is more common and more severe in cold, dry climates. So why warms here? Worse in the condition? Again, it reduces the threshold needed for itching, scratching. But in warm countries, atopic eczema is less severe and less common than in cold countries. And bathing. Bathing with hot water, strong detergents, and scrubbing. But when we come to treatment, bathing with lukewarm water and gentle soap is curative, is helpful here. OK? Infantile eczema, classically. But again, there is a point of difference here. Rash classically starts in the face. Doors of the hands and feet may be affected. Look at this. Napkin area is classically spurred. It's written in Rook. It's not me. We classically know that they suffer more severe napkin dermatitis. This does not seem to be the condition. It's just napkin dermatitis, according to Rook. Elbows and knees are affected when the baby crawls. Of course, rash is erythematous with edematous papules. Starts with, yes, vesicles, crustaceans, papules, itching, scratching, vesicles, erosion, secondary infection, lymphadenopathy are common. This is classic dermatology. Nothing new in here, except for the controversy about the napkin area. When we move to children, then the rash favor, the anticubital and the popliteal fossa. See if I can move my screen up here so you can see. So in children, usually it favors the uh, flexures, anticubital and popliteal. Sometimes it, it uh, favors the extensor areas. It's the old nomenclature, Binier versus Habra Prorigo, we had atopic dirty neck. Here with the frequent itching, vesicles are less, but the papules are more common and they progress into plaques of lichenification. Of course, with acute episodes uh, and remissions and extirpations. And we usually forget the exudative hand eczema. Children playing with soap and water, playing with mud, playing with clay, playing with colors, playing with whatever activities. They are more prone to hand eczema, and here it is acute and exudative. In adults, the hand eczema becomes more diffuse and lichenified. And we have lichenified patches affecting the face, hands, and flexures. Nipples, vermilion, and adjacent skin are commonly affected. Follicular lichenified papules affect the face, upper arms, upper back, especially in Black and Asian patients. The condition is aggravated by thermal sweating or malassezia colonization. 
photosensitivity and hand eczema are more common. And eczema here again affects more than 50% of active atopic eczema patients. The incident increases with age. In children, it is exudative discoid patches. In adults, it is more diffuse like unified patches. In children, it is aggravated by thumb sucking. In adults, it is mostly aggravated by occupational factors. In both cases, nails are affected with coarse beating and reaching. I don't know if there's a real value in our practice for the differential diagnosis in this condition or not, but these items should be always taken into consideration with atypical presentations, especially resistant to classic management of atopic eczema. Just have a look at the items here. They are rare, but should be considered when the case of atopic eczema is presenting with an atypical picture or is severe and chronic than usual. Complications and comorbidities, psychological aspects are very important in infants, children, more even than the adults. Take care of this. There is no effect on growth retardation unless the condition is very severe, which is very rare and usually the cause is negligence from the patients or ignorance from the treating doctors. I'm sorry. They are all prone to bacterial infection and viral infections. The Denny Morgan lines could help in diagnosis, especially in mild cases. Look at the photo of this beautiful child in front of you. The crease in the lower eyelid, this is the Denny Morgan fault. Lip licking is common. Alopecia areata, uh, long thought to be uh, uh, one of the common associations with atopy. This is now controversial. Again, the food allergy here will manifest, I consider it the main factor here of food allergy if the uh, uh, child is suffering from abdominal symptoms, not just eczema. I start considering food allergy with abdominal symptoms. And again, Articaria, the contact articaria, which is not a common condition, is more common in atopics because they have more tendency to release IgE upon contact with allergens. And they may develop articaria that will worsen the condition of the eczema. So, Again, onset in children within the first year is 60%. Remind you, at uh, the start of this chapter, is it was onset in children within two years is 60%. Anyhow, it's common in the first one or two years, and it's very common in the first five years. This is, of course, maybe persistent, intermittent, or mitten. I may take a sip of coffee predictive factors for persistence, early onset, severity, concomitant asthma or rhinitis, of course, and positive family history, of course, nothing new in this. Pellegrin mutation defect in the patient or parents is a predictive factor for severity and chronicity. Again, I'm putting uh, the photo of the card, which I'm proud of. Investigations. Actually, we do not need to make any investigation to diagnose atopic eczema. Investigations may be needed if we suspect an allergen here. So we do the patch testing or whatever test. If we suspect food as an allergen, food restriction and rechallenge is uh, 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 more sensitive than the test. If there's infection and it is resistant, then they may need bacterial culture. Uh, actually, investigations here are for the concomitant morbidities, morbidities and for the uh, uh, complications. I love this premium non noceri. This is the major headline in treatment of any disorder. 
premium lanoseri is most important. Number one, no harm. So to write a treatment, to prescribe a treatment, make sure that the value much outweighs the side effects. With a topic children, the first assessment, history, examine the whole skin, check for comorbidities, check for other systems, and discuss the impact of the disease on the quality of life of the child with the parents or of the adult person suffering from the atopic eczema. The first assessment and evaluation is crucial for evaluating the real case of the patient in front of you, the human being in front of you, of giving him the sense of security with you that you really care. And it helps both of you to tailor the treatment according to the needs, the actual needs, of the suffering human being who is sitting in front of you in your clinic. Classically, the first line of treatment is advice and education, reduction of trigger factors. Believe it or not, these are two, the, the most important two factors, the first two factors in management written in all textbooks and references. Advice, education, reduction of triggering factors. And topical therapy will start with bathing. Here, it's soothing bath. No detergents, no scrubbing, no hot water. Moisturizers immediately after the bath. Tap, just pat dry gently and use the moisturizer to get the maximum effect. Steroids, start with the weak steroids. Never go, never start with the potent and super potent ones and steroid combinations if needed. Oral therapy according to the regulations, corticosteroids, antihistamines, and antibiotics. I urge you not to use any of them if you can, please. And maintenance therapy, you have to teach the patient, teach the family how to maintain the skin in a good condition without the need of treatment. Second line, severe, extensive, unresponsive cases or to morbidity, anxious patients, these are just a minority of the patients, maybe 5% or less. Intensive topical treatment, again, no systemic. Weight trap technique instead of soothing bath. Topical calcineurin inhibitors, tacrolimus and epimacrolimus, will give a hint about them. Allergy management, phototherapy, because ultravirus rays facilitate the conversion of filigree breakdown product transuracanic acid, which is pro-inflammatory, into immunosuppressive cis acid. This is why ultraviolet ray exposure is considered to be immunomodulating, mildly immunosuppressing on the skin. So we can use them. Second line treatment. Have we mentioned any biologic or cytotoxic drug here? It's basically, again, education, soothing the skin, topical treatment. Third line, only to select the severe and persistent cases with careful monitoring. I doubt if any of you have really seen one of these cases or not. And behind this particular case, as I told you before, there is a long history of negligence uh, from the uh, parents or the diseased person himself, or ignorance from the doctor who started managing the case. I'm sorry. So cyclosporin, azathioprine, mesotrexate, myco, uh, phenolate, mofazil, aletretinoin, and biologics. In the diagram here, you see maybe half a dozen of biologics. Each one is just interrupting one of the uh, uh, tracks of pathogenesis of atopic eczema, which one are we are going to use. So please don't get excited in using biologics unless you have a real rationale for using them, and we'll see that. Atopic eczema is not a contraindication to routine childhood vaccination. We mentioned this twice before, and we stress upon it now. Early contact with pet animals. Please get pet animals early in the house and let the 
uh, infants get be exposed to them if you can as early as possible because later first time exposure may aggravate the condition. Dietary manipulations, we mentioned it twice and this is the third time. Gentle detergent free bathing and frequent use of moisturizers are of utmost importance. Topical antibiotics and antiseptics are better avoided. You disrupt the microbiome and you help to develop generations of microbes, of pathogenic microbes resistant to the antibiotics. Please refrain from using them. The drying antiseptic solutions for all lesions are usually safe and very helpful. The problem with them is number one, they are messy. Number two, they are not available now in most of the countries. We are lucky here in Egypt, Egypt that we still have the potassium permanganate lotion, which is very effective, freshly prepared, and it is very effective, non-irritant, non-toxic, and it helps drying the, uh, uh, and doing an antiseptic effect on the oozing lesions without the use of antibiotics. Now, the topical calcineurin inhibitors were really a um, very valuable addition to the tools that we have to treat the eczema and other disease. Tacrolimus, Ointment is always present in ointment and it's more strong than the picrolimus, which is available in cream. So again, that choice may be guarded by the efficiency and whether we need a cream or an ointment. They are steroid sparing. They are very important to use on the face, especially around the eyes. The problem with both is that they induce some transient stinging sensation uh, upon applying them. But the value in steroid sparing, especially in the face, in sensitive areas, flexural areas, and around the eyes and the eyelids, is very important. Because topical steroids may precipitate glaucoma or cataract at a later age. You give the topical steroid, the potent steroid now, and after 10 years, you forget and the patient forgets, but there is a higher tendency of cataract and you'll be responsible for that. Using topical steroids again should be very wise because there is a risk of systemic absorption and local atrophy of topical corticosteroids if you use the super, super potent, highly potent steroids because you want to impress the patient, you want to get the rapid result, but actually you harm the patient, you do bad side effects, long-term side effects, and again, you're responsible for that. Ignorance of the doctor, as I said. Systemic corticosteroids are to be avoided at all cost. They are number one line treatment, as mentioned before, in severe eczema. But please, you start systemic corticosteroids with an infant or a child, and you build up a habit something like addiction and then you start at later life need more doses and then stronger preparations and then you switch to biologics or cytotoxic drugs try to delay this or avoid it at any cost and the oral non-sedating h1 blockers are of no value unless we have urticaria contact urticaria or a real sign of histamine working on the skin but itching here, as we said, is by neuromediators. Again, all forms of phototherapy are safe and effective in extensive persistent cases when carefully designed. And in our sunny countries, we may advise the patient to get exposed to daylight, calm sun, early daylight sun, it will help. Now, cyclosporin, it's effective, but again, there is rapid recurrence after discontinuation. And if you intend to use cyclosporin, please read literature about cyclosporin with patients of kidney transplantation. Cyclosporin should not be used alone and for a long time. It carries some hazards. As a cyclosporin seems to be more effective, and the effect is maintained for a longer time and seems to be safer than cyclosporin. 
ميزة ريكسيت مايكو فينوليت مافيتيل again may be used carefully selected patients I urge you not to reach to this stage do all effort with topical treatment trapping soothing bath whatever and don't go to this especially in young uh, individuals and dupi lumab is maybe the only biologic that carries a hope for the atopic eczema patient because it stops two tracks interleukin 4 and 13 and we mentioned them as pro-inflammatory and the help in filigreen reduction and natural moisturizing factor reduction in the affected skin maybe it could be of help in some resistance severe cases finally choose kindness with your patient I hope this was not too long, troublesome for you. Keep it as a reference. This is just a way to help you go through the textbook. I did not cover everything. I tried to simplify the difficult things. Thank you for being with me to the end. Please do not forget to subscribe in the channel and give me your ideas and comments thank you now how can i get out of this wait 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 this is always the and stop recording <laughs>